We thank you for joining us uh, online. There are a few of us here who brave the weather. I'm going to hand things over to our, um, our speaker. All right. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs> um, you know, I when the list of talks originally went out, um, I was going to speak about this kind of working on a beginning work on an article, uh, kind of thinking about maybe different ways of countering or engaging with anti-Zionism, um, kind of with this kind of the belief that the kind of strategy of kind of like simply going toward the kind of anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, um, even if often it is kind of either masking it or morphing into it. Um, but that it's just like, hasn't really, it's, it's like strategically it's not working really. And it also is something of a dodge because like, you know, I think we need to think about the, the proper response to anti-Zionism in some ways is defensive Zionism. Um, and I feel like there are various reasons why it may be the, the Jewish community, um, isn't focusing on that, but that's another thing. So anyway, um, but I was giving this talk last week. I'll explain how I got to that. Um, and so I just felt like we talk about this and, you know, stay tuned for the, uh, the anti-Zionism talk. Uh, so basically this kind of emerged, um, out of an article that I wrote in the Jewish Review of Books, um, like a little over a week after October 7th. Um, and it was precipitated by, um, basically my, you know, the main learned society, um, in Jewish studies, which is in the United States, in North America, which is called the Association for Jewish Studies. Um, and they, you know, the, on like the Monday after that Shabbat, they basically sent out, um, a statement that was, so thin and ambiguous and just like so weak in many ways like they literally didn't even mention Hamas didn't mention Jews like you literally would have thought there was just like some kind of terrible thing that happened but like you know no idea what happened so um I had been kind of getting increasingly frustrated with the AJS for several years um because I felt as if it was going in a increasingly kind of leftist activist direction, um, to some degree coinciding with, you know, the emergence of like Black Lives Matter and and then kind of going like full scale after Trump was elected, um, and and just a sense that they. I mean, kind of like almost attempt to kind of in my, what I saw is like almost de-Judaizing Jewish studies. Um, so, but you know, like in general, like I have other things to do and like, I, you know, so it's like, I just was like frustrated by it, but I was like, yeah, whatever. But then like something in me snapped like after August, October 7th and when I read that. And, um, you know, I was speaking to my friend, Abe Socher, who edits the Jewish Review of Books. And he said, you know, maybe why don't you write a piece about it? So I did, um, and um, you know, I mean, it focused on these first, the first statement, the second statement, which was different, but I saw flaws in it too. But then it was, it was really a kind of point of departure to just, just kind of deal address some of these larger concerns. And um, you know, I mean, I heard back from a lot of people. And interestingly, most people didn't feel comfortable, and as like, like writing it on social media. Um, but many people communicated to me um, privately, like kind of sense of like, thank you for doing this. I'm sure there are people who, you know, had very different opinion and just didn't contact me. But uh, so it probably goes. Probably reading the Jewish Review books. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but in any case, you know, it kind of got me to thinking about this larger issue, um, you know, of what of what the relationship between academic Jewish studies, you know, as a kind of field or interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary field um, in the university, you know, and the Jewish community should be. Um, and I spoke to Yehuda Kurtzer, you know, who's the director of the Shalom Hartman Institute, or the president's now, I guess, um, 
And, um, you know, we talked about it and then like, whatever, he invited me to get there having like one of their meetings and he invited me to speak about it a week ago uh, in New York. Um, and so, you know, I thought, well, first of all, it was like why in the end I couldn't do that previous talk I was thinking about, I need to kind of defer that. But also I think it is kind of maybe um, a subject that um, is, a, is relevant, um, you know, here as well. So, so that's kind of how uh, it came about. So maybe let me just talk a little bit about kind of the origins of what we refer to today as, as Jewish studies, a little bit about the American history, and then just talk about, you know, current developments, uh, different visions that are being put forward of, of what Jewish studies should be, and just, you know, some thoughts that I have about where we should go and what future, if any, Jewish studies has in the university. Um, so basically, um, I guess the first thing to understand is that like people like me, you know, who study um, Jewish history as a kind of profession, um, you know, in a kind of, a, you know, uh, ecumenical or kind of secular setting, you know, we're very new, okay? Um, the kind of origins of, you know, modern Jewish studies uh, lie in early 19th century Germany, or you know, there was no unified Germany, so the different Germanic states. And, um, and it came about uh, as a result of a number of um, kind of Jews who were scholarly and intellectual, and a number of them had studied um, in universities. Uh, and so they were kind of absorbing, you know, a lot of the most kind of cutting edge critical methods at the time of like studying philology, kind of history of languages and history. Um, and and they so there were a couple of things. First of all, many of them were troubled by the way in which Judaism was kind of uh, portrayed and represented in the universities, you know, because there was a there very much a kind of Christian kind of anti-Judaism, a kind of, you know, basically supersessionist view that kind of saw Judaism's significance, you know, was mainly restricted, you know, to a kind of to the biblical period. And then, you know, uh, kind of loses its raison d'etre with the exception of maybe seeing as a kind of foil to you know, some visions of what might be at the end of time, but nevertheless, a highly um, slanted and tendentious uh, view of Judaism. Um, and there were other issues as well, uh, which was that it was almost impossible to get um, to be hired as a as a professor um, because of because it, so long as you remain Jewish. Um, it's, it's professor, it's part of like civil service in some ways. And so there are various areas that maybe had briefly open to Jews during the years of the Napoleonic, um, you know, Napoleonic conquests. But, you know, uh, with the defeat of Napoleon restoration, you know, a lot of these areas, like some of the gains Jews had, you know, had obtained were rolled back. Um, and so in the late 18 teens, uh, you have several figures who band together who want to um, kind of establish a kind of movement for what they call the Wissenschaft uh, des Judentums or Wissenschaft der Juden, um, you know, to kind of translate, I guess, the, like the science, you know, of Judaism, although that term Wissenschaft has certain resonances in German that it doesn't quite have in English in terms of thinking about sciences, but leaving that aside, um, so, you know, what they wanted to do was basically take these kind of critical methods that they were learning, you know, and that they had learned in university, um, and even you know, some of the kind of cutting edge philosophy, many of them um, had studied under Hegel, for example, uh, and they wanted to kind of apply it uh, to the study of Judaism. Uh, and in particular, they wanted to kind of um, study uh, Jewish history. Now, kind of one of the like you know, main novelties of this whole endeavor was the very idea that Jewish history would be a kind of a worthy um field you know the studying Jewish history would be like a worthy endeavor uh, or in their minds maybe the most important type of study that you could do um you know my um my late 
uh, advisor, his name was Yosef Rushami. He wrote a book about 40 plus years ago called Zahor, uh, which, you know, had a fair, you know, impact outside just, you know, the academy, you know, where he kind of made an argument distinguishing between what he called Jewish memory, um, which had more or less, you know, sustained Jews, um, you know, uh, with kind of certain brief exceptions um, throughout most of their history. And then this turn to history, kind of the critical study of history, um, which he saw as kind of being like a sign of, you know, a, a kind of rupture. Uh, like, you know, part of like modernity and secularization was that instead of kind of feeling like, we don't really need to know the history. We know basically, you know, we were exiled because of our sins um, and there's going to be eventually some messianic restoration. And there might be chronicles that are kept from time, you know, written from time to time. But for the most part, history is not in itself of interest. Um, so the very fact you began to have people who wanted to kind of understand the history and development of Judaism was a novelty. Um, and even, you know, again, also the notion that you should um, study, you know, the history of Judaism or Jews, like, by using kind of these same historical critical methods that you're applying to the study of, let's say, Homer, you know, or some other, you know, and, and really anything. I mean, you see already glimpses of this in Spinoza. Um, but um, you know, and also just the idea that, you know, we should be using non-Jewish sources as well uh, to understand Jews. So, you know, so like for, I'm just like trying to think of an example. Like, you know, traditionally you want to like you want to understand Rashi. What does that mean? Right? Okay, you study Rashi, you read the commentary. Uh, maybe you look at how Tosfo responds to, you know, or, or in the Bible, other, you know, commentators, but, you know, now it's the idea of like, wait, well, we need to understand Rashi's historical context. Like, when was he living? You know, what was happening at the time? Who was he, whom was he engaging with? Uh, how do we understand his commentary in light of, you know, developments in the Christian world at the time? Um, and then by, you know, the, the formation of Ashkenaz and stuff like that. So that whole kind of method of thinking was relatively new. I don't want to make it seem like there weren't some antecedents, uh, but it wasn't part of a kind of movement, you know, and an ideological movement in the same way. Um, you know, and you know, also just the idea of the, the idea that, you know, we... We have to understand Judaism is not something static, but it's something developing, you know, in time. Um, and, I, you know, and, and some people who were involved in this were definitely trying to kind of like marshal it, you know, in support, you know, of a reformist agenda. So um, if you think of somebody, you know, is often considered a kind of founding father of the reform movement, Abraham Geiger. Um, you know, this was kind of what he saw as his mission of like trying to kind of um, you know, focus on a kind of, you know, what is the kind of essential idea of Judaism in some sense that's evolving through time, taking on different forms, perhaps, uh, but, you know, kind of moving away from the idea that the law is central, um, uh, but, you know, also, you know, uh, kind of, I mean, taking certain um, figures or groups that had often been seen, you know, in a negative light in the Christian world. So for example, like the Pharisees, okay? You know, I mean, you think about what the Pharisees kind of represent, you know, in, you know, traditional uh, Christian theology, right? And even the word Pharisee just still exists in English, right? You're too, you know, you're focused on on the letter of the law, it's kind of, you know, there's no sense of, it's like you associate it with a kind of backwardness, with a kind of re resistance to change. And, and Geiger overturned this entirely. What he tried to show, you know, was that the Pharisees and, you know, the Second Temple Judaism, is, like the Sadducees are in many ways, the, the, they were the conservative party. And the Pharisees were, you know, they were the reformist party. So he's almost like trying to look to Jewish history, look at the Pharisees as kind of prototypes um, for his own endeavor. Um, and you can see also, again, part of the motive of these scholars was to kind of wrest Judaism away, you know, from the kind of treatment that got in Christian universities. Um, but there was also a way in which they were also trying to wrest authority from traditional rabbis and communal leaders. They, you know, wanted to, they were making in some ways their own kind of claim to a kind of leadership. Uh, their own claim to a kind of authority that was based on kind of expertise. Now, you could say that a kind of tension exists, you know, between 
this whole enterprise and the Jewish community from the very outset. Um, certainly, you know, in terms of Orthodox Jews, you know, it's really in some ways is only something that crystallizes as a kind of distinct identity, you know, in the 19th century. Uh, but, you know, figures like Samson, you know, Rafael Hirsch, you know, who, you know, on the one hand is seen as something of a modernizer in terms of you know, trying to kind of remold the service to be more conforming to the kind of aesthetic norms of, let's say, a German Protestant service. Um, you know, and also trying to kind of make apologetics for Judaism, you know, kind of engaged with some of the kind of intellectual trends of the era. But he saw Wissenschaft as, you know, profoundly trait, like this idea that you were going to kind of under, you know, take a historical approach to understanding Judaism. He saw its relativizing potential. Okay. Um, and so he kind of rejected it. Or later Orthodox figures like who we've been to absorb it to some extent. Um, but you know, again, they also there was in some ways there was a kind of pull in different directions. So I mean, one of the ideals that's really kind of emerging in this period is an ideal of like objectivity, right? That um, in some ways you kind of need to distance yourself from your own personal commitments. Um, your religious commitments, you know, and, you know, to try to see things, you know, as they are, like, you know, one of these kind of um, cr crucial figures in terms of, like, the development of modern uh, study of history in Germany, like Leopold von Ranke, you know, said, you know, that he had this whole phrase, like, um, history as it essentially was, you know, because I get these um, In other words, you're not, you know, studying at least ostensibly with some kind of uh, purpose in mind, or you're not studying in order to kind of try to help, you know, rebuild Judaism, um, but you're studying to understand, you know, you know, it's a kind of study for its own sake. At least that, you know, I mean, again, it's rarely that simple people tend to have objective, uh, you know, objectives, but, um, but this was an ideal. So already, you know, there was potential for friction um, and different scholars, you know, approach this in different ways. So, yeah, I mentioned Geiger before. Geiger, who is, you know, who is a very important figure in the development, you know, of this in Schacht, but who is also a reform rabbi um, and who is trying to kind of create conceptual underpinnings for reform. That it's not just like, yeah, we want to change some things, we want to like we want to be more like, you know, uh, you know, the the Gentiles, but like, you know, we want to kind of say we're 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 basing this on a kind of understanding of Judaism as it like, you know, essentially is. Um, you know, there were other scholars, you know, this is not a name that will be by any means familiar, but there's a very important kind of scholar and bibliographer in the 19th century named Moritz Steinschneider, um, who was uh, averse to any kind of involvement with the Jewish community. Um, you know, and I mean, you know, they said that he, you know, this might be apocryphal, but, you know, that he basically saw Wissenschaft as a kind of giving Judaism a kind of like decent burial. So that's a different view. And then there were figures who was maybe made the most crucial figure, a man named Leopold Zuntz, kind of was somewhere in between these kind of poles that on the one hand, I mean, he wrote this bi biography of Rashi in 1823. Um, and, you know, there was definitely some kind of apologetic element. You know, he did this whole work on like the history of the like, Jewish sermons um, and made clear in the, you know, the preface that, um, that in some ways he saw like part of uh, the whole project of working toward a, what was called emancipation. Right, the granting of Jews of citizenship and in, integrating them, you know, into the societies in which they live, uh, that it, it, it couldn't just be at the level of like formalities, but it had to involve some kind of, you know, new kind of emancipation of Judaism itself. It had to kind of mean resting it away from the rabbis or these Christian scholars and seeing it, you know, in a truer light. Um, so, you know, but he also never wanted to be involved in a seminary or anything like that. And anyway, the, the point is to, you know, kind of cut this. You know, short. Um, basically, none of these people like could get jobs teaching in universities. So, what do they end up doing? You know, like that they either end up teaching in seminaries. So, I mean, whether that was, you know, the reformed, uh, what eventually was this reformed seminary in Berlin. Uh, many were involved in 
uh, what was called a Jew, you know, it was really called the Jewish Theological Seminary. Um, it what was then called Breslau, was part of Germany. Today it's Wroclaw and in Poland, but it was a you know it was a major Jewish community. And 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 sometimes people see this as kind of like an uh, something of a forerunner for you know what became conservative Judaism in the United States, uh, which was a kind of appreciation for historical change, um, while also kind of believing, uh, at least, you know, kind of in principle that halacha remained binding and valid and authoritative. Um, so with like one of maybe the fam most famous Jewish historian of the 19th century, a man named Heinrich Gretz, taught, you know, at the Jewish Theological Seminary in Breslau. Uh, but basically, you know, you, you had basically no hope uh, of an academic appointment. Um, now, you begin to see already kind of in, you know, late 19th, early 20th century, a, a critique of this in Shah. Um, in a sense that, you know, like there's all this scholarship being done, but like what what's it really serving? Who's it helping? Um, you know, and, and you know, are we really kind of addressing uh, the issues that Jews, you know, who are, you know, trying to kind of figure out their way and especially in an age of rising anti-Semitism? Um, you know, what does this mean to us? So, I mean, just like an example. Uh, like Franz Rosenzweig in, in the 1920s, you know, a very important Jewish philosopher, um, creates, uh, you know, you may have heard this, because now it's like, you know, they have, you know, something called this in Boston or that area, but like a, a lair house in Frankfurt in the 1920s. Uh, and the idea was that you would take Jew different, like, you know, whether, you know, already famous, you know, or emerging Jewish scholars, and that they would teach to the Jewish community you know, to people interested in the Jewish community. And so they would have to think, how am I going to make this relevant to you? You know, and not just be speaking to, you know, those who read the scholarly journals and that sort of a thing. Okay, let's move to America um, and the development of Jewish studies in America. So the first thing to know is that for the first half of the 20th century, really into like the 50s as well, um, there really are only two people who hold chairs, not necessarily in Jewish studies per se, but in anything kind of like, you know, where it's really kind of anchored in uh, kind of Ju Judaism or Jewish history. And that is Harry Wolfson at Harvard, okay, a famous uh, scholar of medieval Jewish philosophy, also Islamic philosophy, um, you know, a famous scholar of Spinoza, for example, um, and Salo Baron. Um, who uh, I think Harry Wolfson gains his position around 1913, 1914, I'm not sure, at Harvard. And Sala Barone is hired uh, at Columbia around, I think, like 1930. Okay. So, um, and there are no separate programs or anything like that in Jewish studies. Like, you know, there are people who are in the history department or I don't remember exactly, probably in the philosophy department, Wolfson. Um, and it was an era in which, I mean, often, I mean, like the, the main, like often the, the figures who were like really Jewish scholars on campus were frequently either associated with what was originally you know, this, uh, called the Menorah Society, okay, but then later is Hillel. Um, because the norm in Hillel, I have to say, really, you know, through uh, the 90s when I was there, was that the director would be a rabbi and often a very learned rabbi at that. Um, so you know, when I was at Princeton, I came the year after someone, you know, Eddie Feld retired. He was a big, you know, Hillel rabbi, conservative rabbi, um, but also very, I mean, you know, he. I remember finding an article that he had written in like Modern Judaism in 1989 about like called Spinoza the Jew. I mean, he was a, you know, someone who published occasionally um, a couple of years into my time at Princeton, uh, Rabbi Jim Diamond, who is a scholar of Hebrew literature. Um, you know, had spent most of his career uh, at the Hillel and Washington University, uh, came to Princeton. Um, and, you know, I mean, I remember, like, we would read Agnon together, and uh, he eventually started teaching some courses, tragically. Um, I don't know, it was maybe 11 years ago now, he was killed uh, by a car that ran him over. Um, but even at Princeton, I mean, sorry, GW, um, someone who I really consider an, an important kind of mentor, um, was this man called Max Tipton. I don't know. I mean, it was something of a DC institution, but um, he had gotten his start as a Hillel rabbi. Uh, he had been a Hillel rabbi uh, starting in 1948 at the University of Wisconsin. 
uh, then moved to the University of Chicago in the early 60s, uh, and then eventually moved to kind of like, what was, I don't know what it was called. It wasn't called Hill International then. It was going to be like National LL in D.C. And he got, you know, became a somewhat controversial figure. Uh, you know, I won't get into it, but anyway, he comes and teaches at GW uh, in 1978, by which point he's already, I guess, like 56, and uh, ends up teaching there for 36 years. Uh, and he died about eight years ago. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, and that was a, you know, these were kind of familiar types. I mean, I just read, you know, the, the someone who had been the rabbi of the Hillel at uh, Harvard for maybe 17 years, Bernie Epstein, or Einstein. Um, Steinberg. You know, he, uh, what was that? Steinberg. Steinberg, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he, uh, he just passed away. Uh, and he had also been somewhat of a you know, similar type. Anyway, starting in like you begin to see in the 60s and then like really gaining steam in the 70s, 80s and 90s um, is that you begin to see the creation of more chairs um, in various kind of areas of Jewish studies, programs in Jewish studies, departments in Jewish studies. Um, and this is something that is really you know, one of, you know, kind of a real kind of significant development in terms of the study, you know, of Judaism in the United States, you know, in that period. Um, and so part of it, you know, in terms of understanding, obviously, as I've explained, this kind of attempt to do a kind of secular study of, you know, Judaism, Jewish history, Jewish religion, Jewish literature, right, has an older pedigree. But why do we see it kind of suddenly kind of emerging, you know, in universities um, in, you know, let's say maybe around the late 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, any ideas? Assimilation. Okay, so concern, like concerns about assimilation, um, especially, you know, um, yeah, as we move kind of into, you know, and growing concern about things like intermarriage. Um, it's also a time, I mean, I should say, again, when you're beginning to see, you know, like more kind of like um, ethnic studies types of programs. I, so it, there is some kind of, you know, I mean, again, I think often Jewish studies, the older Jewish studies scholars were very uncomfortable with like thinking of themselves as like, you know, uh, that they're, they're kind of, um, anal, you know, kind of parallel to them. But, um, but yes, like you have African-American studies, sometimes Latino studies, sometimes just other ethnic studies programs, uh, women and gender studies. Uh, so that's partly related to it. But again, I think really, really one of the main forces that was propelling it, like, I don't think the universities on their own were just like, yeah, we really need to do this. Like, a lot of it was due to American Jewish philanthropy. And the decision on the part of donors that they wanted to endow chairs, or they wanted to endow programs, or they wanted to endow lectures. Um, and so, you know, that was very much, you know, and that itself, you know, all, already made for a kind of tension, okay? Even before we get to the kind of the situation with Israel and Zionism today. Um, because, you know, I think often there was a kind of mis- it was like, a, it was like, I don't know, you know, I'm not going to say they were sold a bag of goods, you know, but um, often what they thought, you know, they were getting out of this, you know, maybe like that people, that Jewish studies was going to help like, you know, build up Jewish identity. Um, you know, or then when Israel studies kind of begins to emerge in the late 90s, mid, mid to late 90s, that you're going to have people who are like, going to be there championing and defending Israel on campus, um, you know, ran counter to kind of how most people who got involved in Jewish studies saw themselves. Like, you know, I'm not a Hillel rabbi. I'm not a Hillel director, right? This is what I do for a living. I'm in, you know, I want, I, I feel like there's meaning and relevance to it, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a counselor, you know? So, um, so kind of a potential for friction, you know, was already there. All right. So, um, so basically, in 1998, uh, at AJ, the AJS conference, um, which used to always be in Boston, like only in the 21st century, they begin to, you know, switch, you know, locations. Um, but a professor of Jewish philosophy, what time is it? 35. Ugh, too long. All right. So I'll just I'll tell you about this and then I will um you know, I'm gonna speak a little longer anyway. Um 
a professor of Jewish philosophy and mysticism uh, who was then in Indiana, now at you know, Arizona State, named Kava Tour Samuelson, uh, gave a plenary lecture. She actually had been asked just to like, step in at the last minute because if someone was ill. Uh, but she gave a lecture that kind of maybe maybe was like the most controversial like lecture ever given, you know, in the 55 year history of AJS, because she basically said that Jewish studies is in trouble. And we you know I know when I read that, I mean, when I read, went back and read a piece, I was like, really? In 1998? Like I thought those were the better years. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, she's saying in Israel is in trouble. People aren't so interested in taking these classes anymore. Um you know, they're more interested in pre-professional classes or in, you know, now, you remember in the 90s, it kind of became modish, you know, after you finish your army service, you go to India or the Far East, you know, they want to study those civilizations. They're not so interested in the typical menu of Jewish studies courses. And she said, you know, in the United States, things seem so great, but, you know, there is a declining number of students. You know, she said at that point, you know, I didn't see it so much at the time. I mean, I, didn't, I started grad school in 99. I was to Columbia. It's a very different kind of place where there were a lot of people taking Jewish studies courses. But, you know, as she's saying at other places, um, it's you know, they're not taking it. And she said also, like, what are we doing this for? And so she said, we need to be more honest about why we went. My, many of us went into this field, meaning that we there was something about um, studying Judaism in this way uh, that related to certain kind of personal existential concerns. Um, and we need to take more seriously outreach to the community, that we should, you know, see ourselves um, as serving the community in some ways. So, like I said, this is very controversial. Um, you know, there's like a uh, there's a listserv in Jewish studies which is called H Judaic, um, and I actually went back, you know, to the archives from so this was December ninety eight. So I looked at the archives for early nineteen ninety nine. People are constantly talking about this this lecture. Um, like the, uh, some, a Jewish historian who was at YU, I don't know if he's retired, he probably has, but his name is David Berger. He's is Berger, he's David Berger, he's alive. Um, he was very uncomfortable with this, you know. Actually, people from other like seminaries like JTS or um, HUC or the Re Re Reconstructionists, they liked it. Um, David Berger didn't like it, and he made the legitimate argument that, you know, our role in our classes, but that wasn't so much what she was saying, but she said our role in our classes is not, you know, to be building Jewish identity. I think probably is somewhat related to his orthodoxy, that he wanted to keep these things a little bit separate. Um, then it was like, okay, so then there was like a, like a real sharp rejoinder in the forward by someone named Jacob Neusner. Okay, and Jacob Neusner probably you know, one of the most famous kind of figures in terms of the academic study of Judaism, you know, in the late 20th century, um, but who had a very, very different vision from, let's say, this, you know, Professor Samuelson about what that should be about. Um, you know, and he basically said, you know, he was kind of always worried about Jewish studies being too Jewish, right? Um, that, you know, he was always, like, he would, you know, feel like it's too much of a ghetto. He often used that term. Um, it's too ethnic, right? I mean, he kind of, at least, you know, certainly when I was started attending AJS, but long before he had stopped going to AJS, you know, he was more interested in the American Academy for Religion. Um, I mean, he comes, you know, a, you know I mean, I, I mean, he's famous also just because he was such a nasty person uh, and was just constantly he full of invective against people of rights. And he wrote vol voluminously too much. Um, but, he, you know, he was an important scholar in many ways in terms of certain critical you know, methods for studying rabbinic literature um, and you know, become something of a theologian later in life anyway. But he did not share her vi vision. He was like, and he was you know, very arrogant. So it was like, you know, the Jewish community you know, has always turned its back on scholarship. They're not interested. They're, they're anti-intellectual, like the rest of American society. Uh, and so we, we don't owe them anything. Um, so, you know, I kind of thought this was worth revisiting just because, you know, maybe like a state of the field right now, um, which I think is pretty dire, to be honest. Um, you know, while you do have a number of you know, more scholars than ever, probably who are um, associated with AJS, although I wonder if we're beginning to see a somewhat of a decline, but leaving that aside, um, even compared to when I started teaching about, you know, when I left grad school about 18 years ago. Uh, first of all, 
not only have in kind of uh, enrollments in classes or people who decide I'm going to concentrate, whether in juice studies at minor or major, even if in, in places where that's allowed. I mean, that has like, you know, dipped dramatically to the point that often there are programs that simply have no students anymore who concentrate. Um, you know, the time when you were seeing, you know, it seems like a new position in Jewish studies, a new chair in Jewish studies every year, like those times have long passed. It was already kind of already over by the time I was going on the market. It was, it was over by the time I was going on the market. But like, I was kind of that last generation almost where it was like still pretty likely that you would find a job. It might take you a year or two of being a postdoc, but you would probably find a job. Like now there are so many people who graduate who are exceptionally talented, brilliant scholars, you know, do postdocs, you know, maybe every year there, and then sometimes just disappear because like they can't get any work. Um, I think that you've seen a kind of drying up um, of the kind of philanthropic support. Uh, and it's not as if universities are showing any interest in kind of stepping in and picking up the tab. Um, you've seen increasingly, I mean, this is a, a real development, I would say, of the last 15 to 20 years of increasingly these foundations that have ideological agendas uh, that are often kind of playing a role in terms of endowing centers or positions, um, you know, and doing stuff outside of the, you know, the academy too, but like Tikva, for example, in terms of a more conservative direction, uh, there was a, a, an organization still exists doesn't do as much in kind of American college campus anymore called Posen, which is all about kind of trying to kind of our, you know, advance a kind of like kind of secular Jewish uh, vision. Um, Schusterman, you know, this like wealthy philanthropic family from uh, Oklahoma uh, in terms of Israel studies. So that's been another development, which is kind of keeping many places afloat. Um, but like I said, the, the, the enrollment numbers are down. The emergence of Israel studies in particular has become um, really contentious because, like I said, um, I think the idea behind kind of creating this as a kind of distinct field or subfield um, was that basically Israel, you know, just didn't receive any kind of fair treatment whatsoever in Middle Eastern studies departments. Um, and so yeah, and many of the early figures who were, you know, leading in this kind of move toward Israel studies were kind of, you know, they were, um, you know, they they kind of tend to be like, yeah, they were so they 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 were scholars, you know, they were critical, but they were very much, you know, like what Michael Walter would call like a kind of like connected critic, right? I mean, you know, they very much identified with you know the pro the Zionist project, um, and. You know, and they and they did see themselves as kind of like trying to kind of remedy a certain kind of mis, um, mis maltreatment of Israel on campus. But increasingly, you had people who were entering this who, um, you know, were saw themselves like you know as critics, not necessarily connected critics. Um, identified more like they wanted to integrate more into the world of Middle Eastern studies, um, and you know, were often you know kind of became like openly anti-Zionist, which led to a whole kind of like, set of scandals. Um, in, involving you know, over the past few years, even chair in like University of Washington in particular. Um, so anyway, there's a growing friction there. Um, and I, here's another thing. I mean, I'll just throw it out that like it's kind of like I don't want to get too much into it because it's a little bit theoretical, but kind of related to postmodernism and deconstruction. Um. Which, like, to kind of boil it down is very much like anti foundationalist, right? It kind of takes these ideas that we think are terms that we think, you know, are just kind of, um, they, they're kind of rooted in reality, okay? And says that, you know what? Like, if you take them and you critic, you know, interrogate them critically, um, you see that they're more like these kind of interpretive frames that we use to make sense of things. And aren't really kind of anchored, you know, uh, in anything beyond that. So, like, you know, there's just been a whole series of like they've taken like terms like Jewish peoplehood or Jew or Judaism, um, and subjected them to this kind of critique. Um, and often it can be very jargony, um, and it's just another way in which, like, I mean, 
like I'll say personally, like, you know, it's not entirely divorced from kind of some of the uh, scholarship I've done, you know, in terms of, let's say the ghetto, like part of it was kind of like, un, kind of like trying to unsettle our notion of like that, the, that of what the ghetto is, right, by showing how diversely that term has been used. Um, you know, I am also interested kind of like in the historical malleability of terms, but I think there's often a sense that if like you show the inventedness of a term, right, the fact that people, you know, at a certain point begin to kind of develop this idea of like, you know, where are people, um, and you kind of see like what, you know, kind of ideological objectives maybe that was meant to serve and then how that develops and then, you know, whether it really works anymore. So you begin to think like, you know, you say, just like by showing its inventedness, it's like almost like, you know, case closed, story over. And, you know, I feel a little bit like, well, you know, it is true that, you know, words that we know never coincide entirely with things, but, you know, that doesn't mean that, you know, they're entirely these like free floating signifiers that don't have any mooring you know, in reality. So I think that's been another development. So, I mean, you know, like what I said at Hartman last week in terms of what, you know, I thought, you know, where I kind of would like to see Jewish studies move. Although again, I'm kind of skeptical about its future in the university. And it's interesting because, you know, I was at Hartman where, you know, you know, there are a lot of fellows and, you know, some of them are professors, but a lot of them are not, you know, there are people who maybe thought about going into professoriate, but, you know, whether it was because of the, just the difficulty of getting jobs, period, or the fact they were like, you know, I don't want to move to Iowa, um, or you know, it was Idaho even, um, or you know, they felt like you know they wanted to be more engaged. You know, they wanted they didn't want to have this kind of pretense of like, you know, I'm not invested in this, you know, um, or I can't express certain emotions that I feel. Um, so people have looked elsewhere. So, I mean, I said basically like in terms of thinking about things that, first of all, I said, you know, I think it would be great. Obviously, you know, you uh, I don't want to create a Jewish studies where non-Jew, you know, a whole part of the whole idea was that this should be something that not just Jews study, you know, but that non-Jew study as well. And some of the, you know, really the leading figures in Jewish studies are non-Jews. I mean, uh, there was a scholar, you know, his, he's still alive, but he, you know, he's retired of, um, you know, kind of like Second Temple rabbinic Judaism named Peter Schaefer, a German uh, scholar uh, who is not Jewish. Um, you know, the, someone who also studied at Columbia a little before me, um, but, you know, a very important Jewish study historian today named Magda Teeter just came out with a book a few years ago about the history of the blood libel. Um, you know, she's also not Jewish. So, um, you know, that was certainly part of the vision, but I do think that, you know, part of, I do feel like part of why in some of these Jewish studies is losing a kind of touch with the community um, is that more people don't see themselves, you know, as connected critics. Um, you know, I said, I, I talked about some of the problems with what I see as this deconstructive term, turn, um, but I also, like I said, I, I think, you know, we need to be realistic. Um, and like, to understand Jewish studies as a kind of enterprise that has multiple stakeholders. Right, not the Jewish studies maybe of certain people's dreams, but the Jewish studies as it is, um, and that the reality is is that it has been dependent on philanthropists and donors. And I mean, I you know raised money to create an endowed chair at GW, um, you know, about seven to eight years ago. Um, you know, but I think sometimes I do feel like I you know there's just a kind of um, a sense often on the part of academics, you know, that donors don't know anything, they don't get the university, you know, they're these, you know, kind of like neoliberal plutocrats. Uh, it's a level of disrespect and not, I mean, it, it may be that there is a gap, you know, and that that gap, you know, needs to be, a, you know, it will, will exist, but there's just ways of, I think, that some people have been unnecessarily inflammatory um, in this situation. So like I said, I don't know about the future of you know, Jewish studies, um, because like I said, I don't, you know, I, th I sense that maybe the, the kind of period where people look to the university, I mean, think about all the feelings vis-a-vis -vis the university today. I think the time when people looked and said, you know, this is, a, this is, this is money well spent, um, and I think those days may be past. Um, and I, like I said, I don't see and people are not taking the courses, you know, and anywhere is approaching the same numbers. Like compared to when I started teaching at GW in 2007, or I taught at Colgate for year 2006, 
you know, where my class is filled. And now, like the only way, you know, I'll come close to that is by making them fulfill like this distribution requirement and that distribution requirement. Um, I'm not saying it's like this everywhere, but it's a general pattern. Um, I don't know what will be. And I, and, I, and I say, you know, I'm not an endowed chair. I'm just a professor. And sometimes I wonder, you know, what if I, you know, left to take a job at university, you know, or what if, you know, somehow came into a massive amount of money and decided, you know what, I just want to write, um, you know, would they replace me? You know, because it, it's not just like, you know, it doesn't mean automatically, you know, there's going to be, they're going to hire another modern Jewish historian departments, you know, have their hiring priorities. And, you know, I just stepped down as chair of history. Um, and, Everything is like trust, like the kind of stuff they're interested in now, like doesn't have a lot to do with Jewish history. And, and only maybe would be people who do something Jewish a little bit, but situating it in a different area entirely. So I don't know if they would replace me. So um, and I realize I've talked for a while. I, I didn't bring a watch, but um, yeah, these are just some of my thoughts. And maybe we can, you know, just have some discussion now in the time that remains. Well, can I ask a question? Maybe you can. Yeah. All right. So, um, when you talk yeah. about Jewish studies, yeah, I, Jewish thought, Jewish history, Jewish culture, Jewish philosophy, do you also mean, or does that also cover, like, which I know is now studied secularly in 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 universities, Bible, Talmud, things like that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, I would say, I mean, the answer is yes. Um, I would say that people who do kind of Hebrew Bible studies, it's often a little bit kind of of a kind of, I don't know, it's like a little bit of an island unto itself, um, historically, but yes, I mean, you know, like if you look at Jewish studies journals, um, let's say that, you know, the flagship of the Association for Jewish Studies, the, you know, the AJS review, you'll have articles on everything from the biblical period to right now. You know, so yes, absolutely, that would be included. Yeah, Reuven. Oh, I'm sorry. There's somebody on. No, no, no. Go, I was, I, but go ahead. And then I think you, there's obviously this is great. There's very rich. There's a lot of different strands here. I'm, I, having studied comparative literature in the 1980s, the whole yeah, idea of, that was my major of, term of, of, of uh, definitions and meanings undermining themselves is is fascinating. I, I'm I'm a little bit a little bit uh, dis disappointed that it's infecting Jewish studies as as well as so much else. But my question is about something different. You began by talking about this very disappointing, what you thought was a very disappointing, mm -hmm. unclear, mealy mouth statement after October 7th yeah. by the, uh, was it the Association for, for Jewish, Jewish Studies? Yeah. For Jewish Studies. Exactly. But, but that in turn, you know, to sort of maybe what I find myself on my mind a lot, like probably like some others, is what is the role in the case of Jewish studies? And you've touched on this, you know, of course, going back to the Wissenschaft and the how much of this is disinterested, objective, almost scientifically rigorous mm -hmm. scholarship, and how much of it going fast forwarding to kind of identity politics and the, the 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 today's campuses since the '60s? How much of it is about advocacy? And I find myself wondering, like, what are what are reasonable expectations for Jewish students? For example, ought Jewish studies to be a, explicitly a Zionist enterprise, which of course a lot of donors might like. I would imagine professors might be concerned. But by the same token, what do Jewish students have a reasonable expectation of to feel comfortable? Mm -hmm. Because you, you mentioned Tikva and the Jewish Review of Books. There are plenty of people on the right who might say it is outrageous that you know Black or Latino students would say that having a you know having an event that opposes affirmative action on the grounds that it's unconstitutional is creating an, an un, inhospitable environment that is unacceptable that's that's making people uh, walk around campus students feeling uncomfortable and unwelcome but if we were to then switch back to israel is hosting some really offensive what i would consider offensive anti-israel mm -hmm. rhetoric uh, basically, I mean, I'm throwing out a lot here, but yeah. should Jewish students have some expectation of comfort and protection against what they feel quite reasonably may be un unpleasant or offensive ideas? Uh, should they be protected from that? Is Jewish studies supposed to be part of that protection? Or is there a double standard yeah. where Jews are somehow expected to be comfortable, but not to make everyone else comfortable? Mm -hmm. I think that's a great, really great question. I think in some ways, 
like it, it's not kind of an like it's not it hasn't been kind of articulated as a kind of explicit debate, but I think that is in some ways a tension between different people, you know, who do Jewish studies or Israel studies. Like, do you see yourself, um, you know, as having any kind of caretaking role? Um, do you feel responsible in any way towards your Jewish students? And I think the answers to that will d d d d you know, depend on the individual in question. Like first, I personally don't think um, like Jewish studies programs, I mean, I know this will sound, you know, in light of the fact I said it emerges at around the same time as all these others, which to a large degree do remain, you know, kind of mired in a kind of advocacy. Um, like, you know, it's much less common. I mean, that you're going to see somebody who, in an African American studies program say something that flies directly in the face, you know, of kind of where the black communal establishment is. Um, then, I mean, they might be even more radical, but like, and that might be a problem. But you know, I mean, it, it, there aren't so many like, let's say, I mean, there aren't so many conservatives. Period. You know, in the university campus, but you're like, you're not going to see probably too many black conservatives in you know African American studies program. Um, and, you know, and Jewish studies is different in that way. And I, like I said, it has a somewhat different pedigree and, you know, I think, and also Jews are at a different place in many ways than some of these other groups that were creating, you know, these types of programs in terms of their level of, um, the degree of assimilation uh, or at least acculturation that they had achieved. Um, so I don't think like programs themselves should see them, you know, I, mean, I think that really in my, you know, in my opinion, runs counter to the ethos of the university, which is above all, you know, in terms of what the university should be about, like, which is above all about the production of knowledge. Uh, that's what universities are about. Now you could say maybe like Jewish studies isn't necessarily, you know, in terms of thinking about its future, like maybe that isn't the place, you know, where we're best, you know, uh, served anymore. But like turning Jewish studies programs into advocacy groups, I think that's problematic. Now, I'll say personally, you know, as an individual, um, I have never kind of felt that I need to make these kind of choices. I don't like binary choices. I always try to think, you know, uh, I don't, you know, I think, yes, there are sometimes certain like irreducible tensions, but I just sometimes think like, I don't kind of work that way, you know? I mean, so from the very beginning, um, dating back to graduate school, you know, in my model at Columbia, I mean, like scholars like Yosef Yerushalmi, I mean, like, it's hard to describe. Like he wasn't Neusner, okay? He came from a totally different kind of world. Um, but he certainly didn't see like Jewish communal outreach as part of his vocation. Um, I mean, he has a complicated biography. I'm not going to get into it. But like I said, you know, like I started teaching adults um, while I was still in graduate school, and also found that I enjoyed teaching adults more than I enjoyed enjoyed teaching undergraduates. That I enjoyed being able to teach adults, you know, Jewish history, but you know, in 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 settings where I felt comfortable having certain conversations about, you know, issues of, you know, Jewish meaning, identity, personal questions, existential questions that, you know, I just would that be out of place in university classroom. You know, so I- If students yeah. approach you then, and if something you've taught them, mm -hmm. yeah. which is some existential interest. Yeah, I'm happy, I, like I say, so like I, there are people who will be, you know- um, you know, Some professors will be like, not my, not my, my like, you know. Out, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hillel. Some people will be cordial, but dismissive. And I've always said, you know, like I, I always feel like, you know, it's like, if Jewish students, if people want to take my course because it's like about heritage reasons, you know, like they want to learn more. So, I mean, you're not necessarily going to get in my class, like um, it might, it might complicate your vision of your heritage in some ways, right? I mean, certain maybe narratives that you've entered in with, um, but like, I don't care. That's great. You know, fine. Take my course. Um, if you want to come to me and, and, and you want to talk about like issues you're having, I mean, I remember, you know, he's become something of a, a little celebrity these days. But, uh, about, you know, when Barry Weiss was still with the New York Times, she ran this piece about 
I can't remember, five years ago, maybe, by this student of mine named, you know, Blake Flayton, um, you know, which was kind of about what he called like progressive anti-Semitism. Um, and, and I remember basically, you know, he started by talking about this rally at GW, you know, where it was about, you know, this is, you know, the kind of inter, the, the kind of distortion of what intersectionality means today, which is that it's all about, you know, any form of oppression is linked to, you know, one form of oppression is linked to all forms of oppression everywhere. Um, and, you know, so they were dealing with, like, I think the labor issue, you know, certain workers on strike, but then, like, speakers brought in, you know, anti-Zionism. And he was like, what's going on here? He came to me, he saw me at, like, eating lunch. And he said, hey, man, I, and, I, and I was certainly happy to talk to him. Um, you know, I mean, and after October 9th, after October 7th, you know, there was a kind of Israel... Uh, you know, a rally that uh, I guess certain pro-Israel groups were holding. I tend not to go to these things. Um, I often find, you know, any rally I go to inevitably, you know, it's like there are people who say things that I don't agree with. Um, and like ugh, so, yeah, it ended up that kind of uh, Chabad ended up like getting like too involved um and kind of displaced the Hillel like director like you know Adina Kirstein which frustrated me greatly but like I felt like you know so what like I gotta be here right now like leaving whatever you know my politics are on, on, on any of these issues aside I need to be here right now but I don't expect that everyone would see that as their place yeah Ruvain, I said yeah right. Right. and we have to be quick we I guess we are, so. they're waiting for us at Mars so, oh, so we gotta so, oh yeah. okay well uh, yeah. So say, yeah, and then we'll illuminate it over tomorrow. No, no, no. The question is, what is the direction of Jew Judaic studies programs? What is the what are the outcomes of these programs and how much has that changed in the last century? To you know, what are students walking away with? What what are we trying to curate in them to be, you know, as students in this, you know, postgraduate world and professional? It's a good question. I think it's too big a question for me to answer now, given that they're waiting for Mara, but let's talk about it. Yeah. Okay. I'm telling you. And then obviously, you can email me if you have any comments or questions that I didn't get. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well done.